Hi again, um, welcome back. Uh, for this lecture, we're just going to go back over. We're going to look at the similarities and the differences so the, of, between Ireland, England and Greece. So the last lecture, we looked at the historical, historical background of youth work in Greece and the previous lecture to that we were looking at Britain and Ireland. So for this lecture, we're going to try and pull it all together and have a think about what was going on, um, what, what were some of the similar influences between the three countries and what were some of the differences and I hope by going through a summary in, in this lecture it might um, get everyone thinking about um, uh, you know what had been happening and where was youth work happening was it happening at all and and in what way was it happening so first of all I suppose what I'm going to start with is sorry is that last slide that I finished with in the last lecture and I just wanted to bring it back up again because again I think um, um, I sort of flew through that last slide and didn't didn't give it the time that possibly it needed even though I know this is in in the article that you have but just just to finish off with it um, I wanted to go back to it and just say that um, there because there were some key turning points in noted in this slide so you had the fall of dictatorship in 1974 in Greece which finally saw democracy restored. So this had a big influence on the the, the, the perception. So beyond youth work, um, the, the, the actual how young people were seen by the state then after 1975 was really key to what happened for young people and what services um, and what sort of frameworks were put in place for young people in Greece from 1975. So um, this was a key year in the development of youth work. So, so the key thing that happened in 1975 was that um, legally Greece made a point of, of, of uh, the Greek state made a point of accepting responsibility um, to to protect young people so that it, it said um, outwardly that it was um, its responsibility in order to keep young people um, safe in, in the country of Greece. So that was really important. So there was there was a a reference point. So whose responsibility was it? The church was it? Charities? Um, no. Finally, it was it was um, the state were labelled as as responsibility, and they took on that responsibility. Nineteen eighty three then also saw free healthcare, which we all know in every country is something is is a real turning point and something really important. Free healthcare, and on top of this, then. Um, we saw this, which was really important, we saw the setting up of the General Secretar Secretariat of Youth at the time. And what this is, and just, just to clarify, um, I know I briefly noted in the last one, what the General Secretariat for Youth did and was, what was set up to do was monitor and coordinate state policies for young people with an emphasis on leisure. So, um, you know, there was, so firstly, you had the fact that the state were taking on responsibility to ensure that young people were protected. You had free healthcare, important for young people, families, old, middle-aged, um, everyone. Um, and then you also had the setting up of, um, of a body within, state, within the state that would um, look after various policies for that were pertaining to young people. So that was really important that they were actually highlighting the importance of um, having a role around um, um, young people and, and what the government were actually doing for young people um, in Greece after 1983. So some of the some of the things that were introduced under this um, Secretariat of Youth over over the, the the coming years were things like um the the discount youth card in in Greece the setting up of youth clubs and also um that there was a network of cultural youth associations so these are just some of the examples when you read on you you when you read on in the article you'll see there's a few more so um you also had actually things like um so social tourism for young people as well was also um set up so have a look at the article and you'll see in more more detail the sort of um progressions that were happening around young people after 1983 because of that setting up of the general secretariat of youth so it really was a positive turning point in 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 work with young people in greece 
And I suppose one thing to say, and just to keep in mind, and it, the same goes for Ireland and goes for Britain, um, is, you know, we had what what we've been what we've seen so far is the history of how young people were perceived and also um, managed and also taken into account or not taken into account in these different um, historical contexts but how far youth work was happening and the actual definition of youth work and and the acting out of those principles such as the empowerment the participation all those values and principles that we saw in the first couple of lectures that i noted as far as those were being acted out is is hard to um define considering it was work with young people but how far it was actual youth work is is hard to say in all three contexts because exact of exactly what we have just noted there was different cultural different social different political um and different economic um influences happening in each country so it's hard to say how much it was how much of the youth work was being you know was youth work and then what were the sort of agendas behind that youth work or work with young people as it were so would we if we were there now would we call it youth work or would we call it work with the young people and this is really interesting question to put to you as you're thinking about those different lenses that we talked about in the first couple of lectures in regard to you know the radical humanist um, the critical social education lens the feminist lens so all of these can be can be brought to the fore um, in looking at how youth work was happening and what were the other influences on that work with the young people at the time so was it youth work was it work with the young people it's hard to say so what I'll use the rest of this this time for is to compare and contrast um, Greece, Britain and Ireland and just to give you initially a summary of each of them just so we can remind ourselves. So a summary of Greece um, and, and this is probably the freshest in your mind now at the moment. So the beginning of working with young people in Greece and, and elements of youth work really began from the 1800s um, after their war of independence. So it was a reaction working with young people was a reaction to um, trying to provide services for orphans and young people in need at the time which was done by as we said private charities and religious organizations okay so there was a need for those types of services um, from this then we saw um, the setting up of orphanages and vocational schools and there was quite a number of these set up and and in particular some of these vocational schools that were set up in the late 1800s are still in existence maybe under different names but are still um, the remains of them are still seen in Greece today so um, initially it was the private charities and it was the the um, religious orders and then as we saw in the 1930s the 1940s the state began to play a significant role but some questions around this was why did they start to play a significant role who who um, organized for the state to play a significant role and a lot of that comes back to who was in power at the time so um and who was um dictator at the time in the 1930s and 1940s and why they wanted to um bring young people on board with them so there was obvious obvious agendas there at the time organizations like we said such as the scouts and the end had a strong relationship with the government and the crown okay and as we mentioned um for example with the scouting organizations they were they were um, made compulsory for a number of years by King Constantine at the time um, and, and um, saw the Scouts as a way of um, coordinating and probably managing young people um, and to bring them online as to what, what, what was wanted um, by the Crown at the time. Um, Post-World War II then we saw trade union movements um, coming to the fore and um, the difference why this was a turning point was because the trade union movements were set up by young people often for young people um, and and not always by young people but it's where young people started to gather um, a voice started to gather momentum around their own voice and um, then we saw some key developments as I just noted then in the 1980s in particular in 1983 with the setting up of the general secretary for secretariat for youth in 1983 which was a really important um which was a really important progression for 
um, working with young people in Greece. So um, Britain then, we had the philanthropies which were funding work with young people. So again, private charities, private donators, you had the higher classes, um, you um, donating and helping and, and, and the religious orders and seeing that their job or their mission, so they were like missionaries going in to help the, the poor class, you had the middle class also um, helping with this and they saw it as their religious um, responsibility to try and guide the working class and the poor. Um, again, questions around people's agendas, um, was it youth work um, and there, there would, would have been elements of youth work but were there particular agendas that were involved in the work that were being done. There was a focus on needs and not necessarily empowerment and it was predominantly done in in cities and urban areas such as uh, was the same in Greece at the time as well. You had the setting up of the YMCA, the Scouts and the Girl Guides, again very similar to um, to Greece and these were, were, were big areas where young people were, some of the initial areas where young people were engaging with um, informal and non-formal education at the time so this was throughout the the early late 1800s and early 1900s um, and obviously we still see things like the scouts and the girl guides are still still in existence um a turning point in britain and this was slightly earlier than it would have been in greece um, but a turning point in britain was the the publication of the abermarl report which which led to what we call the golden age of youth work and this really um, recognise the importance of working with young people in non-formal and informal education settings and um, saw so, um, youth work brought under a statutory framework with, with um, youth workers right, being recognised as professionals in their area and being paid um, a professional wage to do this. So 1970s you saw a drop in young people, the late 1970s um, into the 1980s, the drop in young people going to these youth clubs in Britain and um, so youth workers, um, youth providers had to think of different ways and different models of engaging young people because young people weren't um, coming outside of the home as much to go to youth clubs for various reasons, which, which we talked about um, in that lecture. The 1980s then, um, because of this drop in young people, saw provisions such as detached um, youth work happening for young people um, and in particular young people deemed at risk and the 1990s saw a shift from a youth service to services for youth, okay? So you had um, youth work happening um, in the 1970s and 1980s where young people could come, could engage, um, and there was a youth service there for everyone. Um, the 1990s saw a shift in particular where there were services being set up for particular youth. So this is where you saw things like, it, so the, moving from a universal model, which was for young people, to addressing um, the setting up of services for particular young people. So for example, young people that might be um, in trouble with the law or might need um, support around particular areas in their life, such as mental health. And again, there's pros and cons for this. So, um, so a lot of the money was being put into these services for youth as opposed to a youth service for all young people. And these are in, in the present day youth work for Britain and Ireland have been some of the challenges which we will look at um, in, in later lectures. But um, there's pros and cons which we talked about in, in doing this. And finally, I'll just look at Ireland and then I will um, do the final piece of the lecture in, in a third recording. But um, Ireland then again um, was a bit similar to Greece in that it um, became its own free state um, in 1922. So from 1850 to 1900, it was part of Britain and very influenced by that charitable model and that philanthropic model. Um, from 1922 to the 50s, there was large support for youth work again um, in Ireland. And then from the 1950s to the 1970s, there was a development of national organisations, but still predominantly run by volunteers and the church ha still had um, quite a big influence. The 1970s saw the first state grant for youth work with the 1980s, a bit similar again to Greece, seeing the beginnings of um, the state recognising the importance of, of working with youth in a non-formal and informal education. And you had um, things like the Costello Report. And then the 1970s really saw the development. So we'll look at that more in, in the next one.